Hello everyone, welcome to Mr. Natural's Music School here in San Francisco, California, the Haight-Ashbury District. Welcome. This week we're going to start another new series, and this new series is going to be about learning about the staff again, but this time without the fixed system, we're going to use what's called the movable dough system, except we're not going to use do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, which basically is Latin. It's a dead language. It's gone. Everyone that's using please throw it away. What you're doing is training people's ear to hear things in Latin, and then the problem is it's not applicable to anything else. In Europe, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do is still taught in school, and they do teach kids how to read music with movable do, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. And I've met very some people here in the Haight-Ashbury recently where I was, um, had a score, and some lady just came over and started singing Do Re Mi and started singing the melody and we sat down and had a little talk about it. And she was saying the problem is is that she can look at a score, find out where Do is and pretty much sing the intervals. But the problem is she doesn't know what they mean or what to do with them. So I told her what if it was just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And she said to me, oh that makes sense. Well yeah that makes sense because that's a language we all use. So today what I'm going to do is first explain the differences between the fixed ABC system and some of the problems that come up and this new method that I'm using which is learning to read by interval or by number. Now you'll notice that on the internet more and more people, particularly you'll notice guitar players, are no longer teaching things with A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They're finding out that showing people a picture or a pattern and then just labeling it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven makes it easier for people to memorize the pattern and easier for them to start to play. And they can play things by ear. And many guitar players who've learned to play by interval can pretty much pick up on a song and play it by ear. But the problem is they don't know what to do with it harmonically and they also have no idea um, how to read music on the staff. So this very simple idea of intervals can be applied to the staff and it actually simplifies the way in which you need to read. A major problem with the fixed A, B, C, D, E, F, G system is, one, it's not, it's not comfortable to the right brain, it's only comfortable to the left brain, and the left brain is the part that is logical and figures out everything and is in constant motion and is constantly, I call it the choo-choo-choo-choo-choo train, which is just constantly tugging along, constantly reminding us of everything that we do that we're wrong about, everything that we do that, you know, it just chug, 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 chugs, constantly talking uh, because it's very egocentric. And the problem is there's almost no feelings involved in the left brain. The left brain is purely analytical and it measures everything, by the way, by number, by distance, usually. And it's able to guess these distances so quickly and do things so easily with pattern recognition, et cetera, et cetera, that it just doesn't bother to have any emotional content whatsoever when it regards it. Now, the thing about the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, if we go to the right brain, the right brain is the intuitive brain, it's the one that feels. And if the right brain, which is very good at guessing or estimating things, learns this number system, it turns out that you can learn to read music on the staff or sight read it and do it with feelings, with emotion, which you cannot do with the ABC system. And we'll explain here why. So, the first problem with the ABC system is we have three basically different staffs or clefts. These clefts create this, sta this staff and put these letter names down. So here the G clef, you have C, E, G, B, D, and F on the lines up here. And in the bass clef, these things move down to the spaces. And on the bass clef, we have F, A, C, E, G, D. And then here, this is the transition clef or the uh, also known as the alto clef or the viola clef and where they put C in the middle line, and so you have F, A, C, E with a G. This is actually easier to learn to read, believe it or not, because face is easy to, <laughs> easy to spell. The problem with this is these things are absolutely fixed, and when people like, for instance, people who are learning musical instruments that are not in concert pitch, when a trumpet player or a clarinet player learns to read music, they always start out with the key of C first, because it has no accidentals, no sharps or flats in the key signature. Then later they always introduce them to the F and they add a flat or they introduce them to G 
where they add one sharp. And then what happens is that they go on, they add two sharps, and then they add two flats, and etc., etc., until you get up to about four flats, four sharps. And at that point, everybody starts to crash and burn. As you progress and add more sharps and more flats into the system, you have to hold them in your left brain and remember them as things continue or progress. So the problem is, is that when you look at these things and you're trained to see that is an E, or over here that is an F, you're trained to see that and you go F, first thing that happens with your left brain. But if we're modifying them with sharps and flats, for instance, the first sharp that's added is usually the F sharp. So the minute I look at this, I have to say, oh, wait a minute, that's not a real F, that's an F with a sharp on it. And my left brain has to impose itself between me and the music and what we're doing and then say, oh, that's an F sharp. Now what happens is as you start getting one sharp or one flat, that's no problem. Easy peasy. You get two, a little harder. You get three, difficult. You get four, it's monumental. You have seven notes, just seven notes. And if four or five of them wind up with flats or sharps, then three of them don't have the flats or sharps on them, which means that every time you look at something, you have to modify it in your brain. And that is very, very difficult to do. So if I wind up with seven sharps or with seven flats, then every single thing I look at, the first thing I'm gonna do is say, oh, that's a C, wait a minute, it should be a C flat. Oh, that's a G, oh, wait a minute, it should be a G sharp. Oh, that's a D, oh, wait a minute, it should be a D sharp. And what happens is your brain is doing this secondary thinking constantly as you're attempting to read the music. This is why people who read music practice and try to memorize the music so they can play it fluidly and they can give over to themselves emotionally. But they can't sight read the music emotionally because they have this left brain constantly interrupting. Oh, wait a minute, that's not really an A, that's an A flat. Oh, wait a minute, that's not a B, that's a B flat. Oh, wait a minute, that's a B sharp. What is a B sharp? Oh my God, isn't a B sharp really a C? Blah, 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 blah. And what happens is this constantly interferes with any kind of emotional expression of the music. So sight reading becomes a left brain chore, like a monk sitting down, writing out the Bible, no, letter by letter. And it's just a kind of a, not brainless, it's a left brain process. Let's look at some of the other problems here. First of all, the major problem with the ABCDEFG system Let's write it out here. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then the whole process starts over again. A, B, right? C, D, etc. Now what happens is everybody learns the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, L, P, etc., etc. We learn to take the song Twinkle Star and we learn to sing the alphabet. Here's the problem. How many of you out there right now can say this backwards? Okay, cover it up. Go ahead, start with G and say it backwards. Try it. Okay, you're going G, F, right? Because you've never learned the alphabet backwards. Now there's a song that Soupy Sales used to do on television where he also took Twinkle Star and he sang the alphabet backwards, right? Starting with Z and working it backwards. And if you grew up watching that TV show, there are some kids that when they learn alphabet forward, they actually take the time to learn it backwards. And they don't have much problem with this, but we mere mortals have to practice G, F, E, D, C, B, A. And if you're going up the scale, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, if I'm going, you know, A, B, C, D, E, et cetera, no problem. But if I want to start reading coming down, and I'm starting here with E, D, C, B, A, G, that's a problem. I have to be able to say the alphabet backwards in order to do that. So one thing you have to do, and uh, I did this many years ago so I could learn to read backwards, is I just practiced saying this backwards till I could say, do you have G F E D C B A G F E D C B A G F E D C B A 
If you can't go jibbity say that fast, you're not ever going to read music going down the stack. And this is particularly a problem for piano players who have both a treble clef and a bass clef, and they do not realize that the offset between these two is simply a third. Something here, which is on the line, which is G, you go down here to this line, and that would be G. You have here a C, you go down to the next space, and there's your C. So there's just an offset between these two staffs of a third. And most people don't notice it because they don't look at it as numbers. Right? So the problem is people learn to read the treble clef because of the melodies are in the right hand. And the left hand, which is playing blocked chords or simple patterns, they don't learn to read very well. And particularly going down the staff. They have a hard trouble going up the staff on the bass clef, coming down the staff on the bass clef. Darn near impossible. Okay? Let alone reading viola music or alto music, or, or transposing this. Now, all these clefs, as I've explained to you in history, were movable. And the clefs actually told us what the key was. For instance, when this treble clef was created, it was actually the letter G, and they were telling us that this line right here was the letter G, and it was Do, or one. And that made things simple. You just put the clef, boom. Now, for French, the French violin, they actually put this down here, right? So this is one, or do, using the French violin clef. The bass clef, at one time or another in its life, was on every single line here. And it used to be upside down. It actually was this, which we now use as at in all of our emails, right? So-and-so at right and then what they do is they turned it over and made it go that way and this here x marks the spot so this is actually the letter f and it marked where f was but f could be moved to any one of these lines and this is called the transposition clef because it always points at c and since we learn to read in the key of c first and it's the easiest thing for us to learn you get used to using this clef and i can move to any one of these lines. However, none of these clefs, none of them can be moved to a space. The clefs can only show us lines. They only hang on lines. So they never showed us spaces. And later a new development came along called the key signature, which allowed us to move do or one to a, to a space eventually. Okay? The next thing that happens is, so you have these around so let's hear here this is F sharp this is C sharp this is G sharp and this is D sharp if we're using the treble clef and what happens is I have to hold those four things in my brain so every time I'm starting to read music every time I see a C whether it's here or whether it's the C down here since this is what's called global and it applies across the board across the entire piece of music Every time I see something that looks like that, an F, I have to say, oh, that's an F sharp. Or every time I see a C down here, I have to say, oh, that's a C sharp. Every time I see a G, I have to say, oh, that's a G sharp. This gets in the way of reading. Over here with the flats, we have the same problem. Not only that, but because the previous flat is the name of the key, and it already has a flat on it, these are not called B or E or A. This is called B flat, and this is called E flat, and this is A flat. And so now what we have to do is hold these in our head and play in the key of B flat, or in the key of E flat, as, as this is here, E flat, and then we have to hold those, and every time I see an E, I have to say to myself, oh, it's got a flat on it. Or every time I see a B, I have to say, oh, that's got a flat on it. Or if I, if I see the B down here, you say, oh, that's got a flat on it. So my left brain is constantly interfering. We don't have this problem with doing it by, by number or by interval, okay? So what is, the, what is all this left brain stuff really about? It is simply the key signature and the clefs simply tell us 
which line or which, which of these lines or which of these spaces here, which of those is going to be do or equal the number one? That's all. Now, there's a trick for learning this we will learn next week, and uh, I'll mention it at the end of this lesson. But these key signatures are not as complicated as people think they are because there's a pattern where on the sharps it goes down four and up five, down four, down four, up five, down four. And on the flats, it goes up four, down five, 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 up four, down five. Simple pattern. But what you don't know is the one furthest to the right in both cases always is a single letter number. So it doesn't matter if there's four sharps here, that sharp is going to be a number. Or if I have seven sharps, that sharp is going to be the same number. It, and with there's seven flats here, that's going to be a number. If there's just three flats, this is going to be a number between one and seven. It's that simple. And then what that does is that number allows us to figure out which line or which space the number one is at. And once we know what that is, we can forget about the sharps. We can forget about the flats. We can forget about the clefts. None of that stuff is needed or necessary to actually play music or to read music if you're using the interval system. However, with the ABC, you're constantly being brought back into your left brain and constantly trying to modify as you go everything that you're doing, all right? So <clears throat> what we do is with the uh, system that I use by interval, once we establish where the key is at, where the key is at, or where one or the do is at, then what we do is we use a very simple numeric pattern that allows us to label all of the lines or allows us to label all the spaces because they have this pattern in common which goes on and on and on forever. And the pattern is simply this. One, then you skip two and go to three. You skip four and go to five, you skip five and go to seven, then you have one, two for the next one, you skip over, over three and go to four, then you skip over four and go to six, then you skip over six and you come back to one. So if I'm labeling, for instance, this as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, like that, You'll see there's this pattern of one, the next line is three, the next line is five, the next line is seven. If we take a look at the spaces, you'll notice that starting here, the space, this space is two, the next space is four, the next space is six, and then we come back to one again, two, four, six, one. So what's happening here is every other letter becomes simply this number pattern one three five seven two four six one if i'm moving up let's say this is one if i move up to the next line it will go to this next number three if i move up to the next line it's going to go to the number five if we go down the lines what happens is this line down here takes this pattern backwards six and we go down, and then this line would be the number of things. It would be easy now to figure out everything in between. All I have to do is between 1 and 6 is going to be a 7. Between 6 and 4 is going to be a 5. Well, look, here's the pattern starting to evolve again. I could guess that this space right here is 3, and I could guess that this is 1. Is that this is one, and what happens is this is two, because seven, two, and then the next pattern is four, and then the next space is gonna be six. And what happens is it doesn't matter whether it's a line or a space, this pattern going in this direction always goes up, line, 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 or space, 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 and going in the other direction, it just simply rotates this backwards. So in this numeric system that we're calling to use, this, becomes your holy grail or your super decoder ring. You put on your little super decoder ring, 
and you turn this and we say, okay, the number one is gonna be the key of C, and at that point, I can align the numbers to the letter names with no problem at all, and play in the key of C by using the number patterns. So we're gonna learn more about how that's organized next week. For now, just to give you a little hint, okay, <coughs> one of the problems is figuring out from all these complicated key signatures up here, where is, where is one? <clears throat> well, it turns out that if, when you do a numeric analysis of this, you find out that every time we go from C to G, we're adding one sharp. We go from G to D, we're adding an, another sharp. We go from uh, a D on to the next and the next to the next. Each time we do that, we're adding another sharp, another sharp. And every time we add a sharp, that sharp is always added at the end. So what we have here is first comes in this F sharp. And then what happens is we go down for it to the C sharp. Then we go up five to the G sharp. And every time this is happening, a new sharp is being added on the right side. And it turns out that when I go from C, which has no sharps and flats, to G, where I add one sharp, the number of that, of that interval always winds up being the seventh step of that scale. So G, A, B, C, D, E, F, sharp, G. So the seventh step of the scale is always that last sharp. Now, if I have one, two, three, four sharps, the last sharp here is D, but that would be the number seven. If I have F sharp, C sharp, G sharp, D sharp, A sharp, A sharp, which is B flat, Hardly anyone calls it A-sharp anymore. And we go up to E-sharp. Well, what the heck is E-sharp? Well, E-sharp is F, right? E-sharp. And if I say, oh, E-sharp equals 7, I can figure out where 1 would be. It's very simple. In every one of these cases, here is the sharp. It's on this space right here. So if I add a ledger line here, right? If I add the ledger line there, that would be where one is. Or I can count down. If this is seven, then this space here would be five, this space here would be three, this space here would be one. So three sharps is the key of A, if we're using the treble clef. Or I could just go seven to the A, and that tells me where one is. Once I know where one is, in this case, watch. If I do this, We'll use that for our, our clef, and we'll just say X marks the spot. So this is one. Now I can simply label three, five, seven, six, four, and I have half of the staff numbered already by just using that pattern. So let's look and see what happens with flats, okay? When I put in a flat, usually the first flat that comes in is B flat, then the next one is E-flat, and the next one is A-flat. Well, what happens is when I add the B-flat in the key of F, that would be 1, 2, 3, 4. When I'm adding the E-flat, that's 1, 2, 3, 4. So the last flat is always going to wind up being the number 4. So I know that this right now is the number 4. Well, guess what? Two, that must mean that this space right here is the number one, which is E. And since there's a flat on E, it would be the key of E flat. Okay. So with the number pattern system, if we know that the rightmost flat is always going to be the number four, we can work it out. I can also do this, four, six, one. Oh, so there's one. Well, what's that? That's E, and it has a flat on it. So it's the key of E flat. Okay, let's try 
E flat, B flat, E flat, A flat, right? Then comes in D flat. Then comes in G flat. Then comes in C flat. Well, wait a minute. C flat is going to be the number four. So if we count backwards, four, three, two, one, right there, that's going to be the number one, or do. And because there's a flat on it, it's a G flat, this would be the key of G flat. Now we don't need to know this letter name once we figure out where one is, because if we're doing this by interval or by number, we do not need to have the key signature. Once I figure out where this is, I could do this. Just keep that one flat there so I know where four is and use that as my reference. Or how about if I just keep this one sharp, just keep that one sharp there and say, oh, that's a, I could simplify this whole thing by simply doing this. I could say, since the number seven is always the sharp, the last sharp, then I could tell you the key signature by just simply doing this. That's all I need. And we say to ourselves, oh, that's seven. So that must mean that that point right there is the number one. Now in the treble clef, that would be called D. So that would be D. But in the bass clef, that would be called F. So it would be the key of F. Just that simple. If I have flats, doesn't matter how many flats I have, <laughs> if I put a flat here, since that's the number four, four, three, two, one, oh, one is gonna be on this line. And it doesn't matter what it's called. Once I know where the one is at, I can then go on and label my lines and spaces and go on to learn to read or to enumerate this thing. And none of the sharps globally will affect this if I'm playing a major scale, and none of the flats will affect it, and the clefs won't affect it either. If we want to call it a name, we can call it a name, but we don't have to. We can look at it as purely by number or by interval. Now, why would I want to do this? One, it's easier to learn. Two, I can start out learning to read in any key. It doesn't matter if I'm learning to read in the key of C, and then the key of G, and then the key of F, and to go through this pattern. It doesn't matter. Second of all, I can tell every instrument in the orchestra that is not in concert pitch what they read on the meter for their first note is what the scale actually is sounding in concert pitch. So when trumpet players play the C, they'll find out that when they put a meter on their instrument, it shows B flat or A sharp. And so they're playing the key of B flat, not the key of C. And since we're using a numeric system, I can start anywhere. It doesn't matter where on the staff I start. And the other thing is, since the clefs don't matter and the key signature uh, doesn't matter after I know where one is at, we can ignore all that stuff. So I can learn to read music by just starting on a line or starting on a space anywhere I want. And what we're going to find out is if we start on a line, Those are the easiest key. These are the easiest keys to learn to read. And what I try to do with my students, we start them in what would be the key of G, and we also start them in the key of E, so they can learn to read by having this nice solid line there as their reference point, and then they can take it from there. Then later, what we do is we introduce A, F, and D, and they learn to read off of the spaces. And then once they've got this, those down, it turns out that if you just turn the staff over, whoops, <laughs> I caught it. If you turn the staff over, then this becomes the D line, and that becomes the F line, right? And then this becomes your, your A, your C, your E, and your G. And it's just as easy to read. So you only really need to learn to read basically in five keys, either two or three 
um, lines and two or three spaces. And once you learn that, and you learn to do it easily, it's a snap. Another thing about this is, it doesn't get any harder. When I learned to read in the key of G, and I learned to label one, three, five, seven, and then label this six, I'm off and running. If I need to put ledger lines in here, right, then this is gonna go two, four, six, back to one. And I can put as many ledger lines in here as I want as well. This will be four, this will be two, this will be seven. Uh, four ledger lines below is gonna wind up being a, a five. It's easy peasy. And if we're starting on a space, for instance, it's gonna be just as easy. One, three, five, seven, and then there's two, and coming down, the, this would be a six, space under that would be a four, space under that would be a two. Here, the space above that is gonna be four, the space above that is gonna be six, and the space above that is gonna be one. So it turns out that once you learn to read off of a line, and once you learn to read off of a space, that's it. And it is not any harder to learn to read in any other position anywhere here at all. So what happens as I read in more keys, it stays just as simple as it was when I first learned. So if I learn to read off of a space, for instance, and I get going, say we're doing D, later I learn to move it up to F and it's just as easy, move it up to A, it's just as easy. All that happens is we get to see notes that are mapping in on the bottom of the thing. If I start out up here in, in D or B, and then go down to G, and then go down to E, then what's happening is we're just going to map in notes above one, making it simple. So turns out that this system is a lot easier. So as we go, it doesn't get, when we get four sharps, it gets harder. We get five sharps, it's almost impossible. Very few people can read past five sharps, let alone six or seven. Almost nobody does. You have to play piano for 20, 30 years to get to that. Um, you do up to five flats is very common because horns are very common in jazz bands. So five flats, but six flats, seven flats, nobody reads in those keys, let alone double. We can double sharps and double flat. I can have uh, up to, um, I can have here a double sharp and then put a single sharp here, a single sharp there, right? A single sharp here, a single sharp here. Single sharp here, single sharp here, and now what I have is I have eight sharps. Who can read in eight sharps using the ABC system? Nobody, nobody. But this is no harder than the other because now what happens is my last double sharp is gonna be seven. And I know that all I have to do is go to this space right here. And that is going to be where one is. That's simple. And then once I know that, I can get rid of all of these and just start playing. So what happens is easy peasy. If that's one, this is six, there's four, there's two. Here's where the other one is at. Here's, um, if that's one, there's six, there's four, there's two, etc., etc. Easy to do. Anyway, that's it for now. Uh, we're going to pick up on this next week. I'll explain this number system again and how it works. Now, here's another thing. Um, when we're talking about A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I want you to realize something. That this note can be the key of E. I can put a flat in front of it and make it the key of E flat. I can put a double flat and make it E double flat. And that's one, two, three keys right there that would all take off of this, this line. And it wouldn't matter in terms of the name, which of these it is, numerically, it's gonna be the same. That's gonna be one, this is gonna be the third of that scale, this is gonna be the fifth of the scale, that's gonna be the seventh of the scale, that'll be the second, or what we call the ninth, and then uh, on up, so you got four, six, 
one, easy to label. And another thing, this could be E sharp. Instead of, um, instead of a flat, I could put a sharp on this and have E sharp. So now I have the key of E sharp. Or I could put a double sharp, which is an X with dots in either corner. And so now this would be the key of E sharp sharp. So now from this position, I've got one, two, three, four, five. I have five keys here, which if I played the name game, E, e, e flat, no problem. Double E flat, problem. E sharp, a problem, because that's really F. And double F sharp, that would really be the key of F sharp. As it, you know, So now we've got some problems spelling these guys here. We have no problem spelling these two out of five. There's five possible keys for this one line. Same here. I can have A. I can have A flat. Or I can have A double flat or I can have A sharp, or I can have A double sharp. One, two, three, four, five keys, and all five of those keys would simply be that space as the number one, that space is three, that space is five, the space above would be seven, going down six, four, etc. So it turns out that when we learn to read by interval, that line will work for all three, all five of those keys. And if I'm reading by interval from here, this will work for all five of those keys. Now we have seven letter names times five. There is 35 spellings. For the major scale. Now there are some people that teach up to 21, but that's because they're not including the double sharps and the double flats. As soon as we start going into double sharps and double flats, you can spell up to 35 A's. <coughs> I can start with A, go have five there, B have five there, C have five there, D have five there, etc. etc. And there are 35 spellings for the major scale. Now I happen to have memorized all 35. And the reason I've been able to memorize all 35 is not because I'm teaching them, but because I learned this trick of learning to read by interval. And here's the thing. No key is any harder than any other key. And as I work the system and continue to work the system, it actually gets easier and easier and easier to learn to read by number and another advantage is in the fixed system when I'm playing the fixed A, B, C, D, F, G, if I learn a song, let's say, in the key of G, I cannot play that in another key instantly on my instrument. But if I'm learning to play the B flat scale, which is C on the trumpet, and I know it's B flat, all right, I can just play that one scale and read music in any key off of any space or any line anywhere here and I'll be instantly transposing that music into the key of B flat, which is the key that I'm playing. If I'm on a flute and I'm playing the key of C, all right, I can read music that's in G or A flat or double A sharp, which has 17 sharps. Double A sharp, which is B, spelled as A, would have 17 sharps. And all I have to know is which is the last new sharp that was added, which would be a double a double G with a sharp in front of it. So you'd have a triple sharp. And simply, all it would tell me is that this next line is where I'm going to start reading off of. That's going to be my one. So that'll be six. That'll be four, two, seven, five, three, one. Easy peasy. Reading this by, by number, and playing any scale, I'm going to be playing in that scale. Okay? So all we need to do with this system is learn one major scale on any instrument, and we can begin to learn to read in all of the keys equally well, and it's not going to get any harder. 
So I'd like to call it there and thank you all for coming. Next week, we're going to start this method of learning to read. Now, the key thing here is learning to teach your right brain to see the size of the interval and say it like that, guesstimate it without thinking. If I can stop your left brain from going choo 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 chugga 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 and constantly interrupting all the time and teach you to see an interval and just say it as quickly as I can show it to you, then you can read by number easily. And the more you practice in different keys, playing in the same key on your instrument, the easier it's going to get. And if you stay in one key on your instrument, you're going to learn technique up the wazoo. In a year or two, you'll be able to play in that key better than most people can play anything. And then when you start learning new scales, the new scale will just be a new fingering pattern or a new position on the keyboard or a new position on the guitar or whatever. And then once you learn that new key, you can play everything you've ever learned in that key and everything you've ever read in that key as well. So, thank you. Have a good night. We'll see you all next Thursday. Same time, same station, 7.30. We're on the left coast here on the west, so we're in Pacific time. So 7.30 Pacific time. See you next time.